Good afternoon, and welcome to this webinar, the third of our webinar series for today, Wednesday. Hi, my name is Kevin Wong, and I am the director of the Desert Institute at Joshua Tree National Park, which is the educational program of the Joshua Tree National Park Association. With me is Lara Roselle of the National Park Service, who originally proposed this series of webinars to train park staff on park-specific projects while they are working remotely during this pandemic. We will be your hosts and the producers of these webinars. Before we get started, I would like to offer some tips on how to use this webinar effectively. As internet bandwidth is heavily used in California during the stay at home direction, and so many of us are working remotely, we may have issues with internet connections. If you're using audio through your computer, and if the audio poses problems during this presentation, you may want to turn to the call in option the phone number and access code for the presentation is found on the registration confirmation page that you all received. In addition, when the webinar begins, you will see a small control panel on your screen, generally in the upper right-hand corner. If you click on the red arrow, the control panel will expand. At the bottom of the control panel, there is a question feature where you can ask questions that we will present to the speaker at the end of the presentation. Also, if possible, during the presentation, we will have some pauses to allow the audience to ask questions. And therefore, we will unmute the audience and then you can ask your questions. But please try not to ask all of your questions at the same time. At this time, we will begin. Today's presentation is Climate Change, Joshua Trees in Optimism with Chris Clark of the National Parks Conservation Association. Chris, thank you for being here today. Well, thanks for the invite, Kevin. And uh, this uh, seems like a really wonderful series. It's uh, such a great idea. And I hope uh, hope everybody is finding this uh, the series useful. I wanted to start just by saying thank you to Park Service staff for uh, taking such good care of this treasure that we have here in the neighborhood. It's, a, it's an amazing place and it is uh, besieged on a bunch of different sides by well-meaning and not always well-meaning folks. And uh, I just, I'm so privileged to, to live around it. And I'm very, very grateful to all of you who work every day to keep the landscape healthy and protect it and explain it to people. And it's just, a, it's a wonderful job you're doing. And here's a picture of a different park. This is a photo of SEMA Dome in Mojave National Preserve, uh, Clark Mountain in the background there, no relation. And uh, I just like to start with this photo because it, it shows what Joshua trees can be as part of a thriving ecosystem. And we've heard a lot about uh, threats to the Joshua tree and those threats are real and they are scary and pervasive. And we have a lot of real scary, pervasive information coming at us these days. So I thought I'd offer a little bit of reason for optimism about the eventual future of Joshua Trees. Uh, and like any discussion of the future, the best place to start is in the past. This uh, is John Fremont, who uh, looks remarkably like he might be present day serving people espressos at crossroads in downtown Joshua Tree, but uh, he was actually an explorer, discoverer of a lot of things in the West for, uh, for European culture at any rate. Complicated person, first Republican uh, candidate for president uh, back when the Republican party was uh, significantly different. Uh, an abolitionist, he uh, freed a number of uh, the African-American soldiers in his battalion. And um, he also was responsible for a couple of really heinous acts like genocide of a large encampment of Wintoon people in the Sacramento River. Uh, so complicated person, like, like many historical figures. On the 14th of April, 1844, he was traveling from coastal California back towards the east and he came over to Hatchapi Pass, uh, probably in the vicinity of Oak Creek. 
for those of you that know the West Mojave. And he recorded in his diary, which was later published as book report on the exploring expedition. And the title went on for another paragraph or so. Um, he wrote words that if you were lucky enough to uh, have taken part in Kane West's uh, webinar from last week, you will be familiar with, may be familiar with them already. Came upon Joshua Trees and he said, he wrote, their stiff and ungraceful form makes them to the traveler the most repulsive tree in the vegetable kingdom. Uh, credit where credit's due, this phrase may have actually been penned by Jesse Benton, Fremont's wife, uh, who is generally regarded as a co-author these days on that report. Kane uh, cited this as the most insulting thing ever said about Joshua Trees, and I think I have to differ because in uh, the early 20th century, uh, Francis Fultz, uh, sorry for that little typo in there, uh, Francis Fultz wrote in an article on the lilies of California in Scientific American, Whenever I see the Joshua trees, I think how considerate they have been in choosing to make their home where few men have a desire to live, which seems a little bit nastier, but for real shade thrown at Joshua trees, uh, it's really hard to beat uh, Joseph Smeet and Chase in his California Desert Trails book of the same year, 1919. Uh, it is a weird menacing object, more like some conception of pose or durace than any work of wholesome mother nature. One can scarcely find a term of ugliness that is not apt for this plant. Misshapen pirate with belt, boots, hands, and teeth stuck full of daggers, and you can read the rest. It's, it's, it's speaking of harsh and rasping, that's, that's, a, that's some serious purple insulting prose. But there's, uh, for some reason, uh, these guys uh, have faded into obscurity where their insults of Joshua Trees and Fremont's live, lives on. And it's interesting because he, uh, he wrote something that was uh, actually kind of softened the blow in the next sentence. Uh, sorry, the previous sentence. Crossing a low Sierra and descending a hollow where a spring gushed out we were struck by the sudden appearance of yucca trees, which gave a strange and Southern character to the country and suited well with the dry and desert region we were approaching. That seems like a, uh, it seems like a kind of a compromise, kind of uh, walking back the insult that's to come, pulling a punch. And ironically, this somewhat nicer uh, statement, somewhat more kind statement, may actually have not been accurate because as it turns out, Joshua trees are not necessarily well suited with a dry and desert, desert region that they live in. They're actually a relic of a cooler, wetter time. And they're just sort of hanging on in, uh, in refugia throughout the desert. They, there are a lot of refugia of uh, adequate moisture and temperature, but uh, it is a shadow of its former range. Here's a, an interesting map. Now, the Pleistocene distribution of uh, Joshua trees uh, shown here in crosshatching. And you want to be careful with maps like this, not to assume that there was ever a point at which Joshua trees filled the entire range. There are obviously uh, lots of variations in topography here. There are going to be uh, cooler times when Joshua trees grew further south, and maybe their northern northern end of the range was somewhat south of where it is now. Uh, it's very likely that there were times when Joshua trees didn't grow in the mountain ranges, but only in the valleys uh, when it was quite cool and wet. So just imagine this is sort of a rough average, but it's pretty clear that uh, Joshua trees are currently in uh, just a, really just a fraction of their historic range. And during a lot of that period, when they lived on valley floors, they lived in vegetative assemblages that were very much like what we see here, which is uh, in the Western Mojave, uh, up a little bit 
in elevation in the San Gabriels. This is a pinion juniper forest with uh, Joshua trees as sort of a minor component of the vegetation. And that was what Joshua trees did for a lot of the Pleistocene. During the pluvial, when Joshua trees were uh, uh, living in the Mojave, they were surrounded by a much moister climate. There were standing lakes of fresh water in a lot of the valleys. And conifers like pinion and juniper and a lot more white fir, uh, spruces in some places. Uh, there were freshwater streams. There were Lahontan cutthroat trout in the Mojave River. Uh, imagine fishing in Barstow. And then of course, uh, 12,000 years or so ago, the Mojave started to dry up and by 8,000 years ago, uh, it was pretty much as we know it today. And Joshua trees retreated to, uh, to refugia throughout the desert. We're gonna talk a little bit later about two different uh, types of Joshua trees, recently thought of as species. This map has a little bit of a hint as to why they uh, uh, separated. You see Death Valley there, it's a big white splotch. And then there's a white splotch to the uh, lower right of Death Valley. Those are areas where it was very likely to have been too low for Joshua trees ever to really have done well in the last uh, 5 million years or so. The, uh, the lower splotch is the uh, generally the area where it's thought there was a large inland sea uh, between nine and four million years ago. And that uh, came about very likely as a result of the Grand Canyon being cut into the, uh, uh, into the, what would later become the Northern Arizona upland. And lots and lots of sediment, even more than the Colorado carried before we put all those dams on it, uh, would create uh, uh, obstructions and temporary dams and it would alter the flow of the river. And there was this place that's called the Baus Embayment, um, named after a small town in Arizona where the, uh, um, uh, where the tufa that was laid down in that, uh, in that page was first described. But you can see it all throughout, uh, all throughout the area, the southern Cadiz Valley, south of, uh, uh, south of Blythe in the Mule Mountains. And uh, it's, it's interesting that there is not much consensus as to whether that was fresh, brackish, or saltwater. Um, but it is uh, thought that there was a long-standing lake right around there. And so, when that lake was created, it cut the Joshua tree population in two. They moved northward over the course of years and in that uh, valley that's marked number 22, uh, the Tickaboo Valley, the one that uh, should be showing up as darker blue on your screen, uh, both of those kinds of Joshua tree grow natively. Uh, this is the one place where they grow together in the world. And here is a photo from there. The uh, blue arrows show the western form of Joshua tree, which until recently was considered by a lot of botanists to be a subspecies. Uh, Yucca brevifolia brevifolia is the type subspecies of the species. And the green arrows point to Yucca brevifolia jaegeriana, named after Edmund Jaeger, the Dean of Southern California Desert Botanists. Uh, of course, Yucca brevifolia brevifolia, which means the short-leaved, short-leaved yucca, has longer leaves than Yucca brevifolia jaegeriana. So that's just one of those uh, perverse uh, uh, quirks of uh, using Latin for multiple purposes, including indicating type species regardless of what the Latin actually means. At any rate, you can see them uh, growing here together. They do hybridize, uh, but not often enough and not easily enough for them to really be uh, considered a unique uh, single species. And that's uh, 
uh, that's relevant later in this talk. Uh, the differences between the two are uh, uh, fairly marked once you know what you're looking at. Uh, probably the resources staff at Joshua Tree are old hands in determining this. Uh, the main difference that uh, drives a lot of the other differences is that the Eastern Joshua Trees, the Jaegerianas, uh, have a, an ability to branch dichotomously which basically means that growing tip at the end of a stalk will just sometimes split into two growing tips. Uh, the Western Joshua trees branch at the site of injury, and that's about it. Uh, we have injury broadly defined to include flowering. That's when that terminal bud becomes a flower bud instead of a leaf bud, uh, creates flowers, creates fruit, and then dies back and the uh, uh, terminal bud, when it's dead, doesn't secrete the plant hormones that uh, inhibit budding down further down the stalk, and so you get lateral buds coming out. That is thought to be the only way that the Western Joshua trees ever branch, whereas the Eastern Joshua trees can branch just when they feel like it. And as a result, uh, Jaegerianas will branch earlier. Uh, they don't have to wait to be injured or to flower. They'll branch more abundantly. They tend more toward shrubby uh, forms. And the uh, Brevifolia brevifolias, uh, they can become good sized trees. Uh, Jaegerianas can as well, but it's more common for them to be uh, shrubby than it is for the, uh, the Western Joshua trees. So that's one major area of, uh, of botanical uh, genetic diversity within, uh, within Joshua trees writ large. And uh, even within the species, there's a whole lot of uh, adaptability uh, to, uh, to different kinds of ecosystems. They grow in a lot of different places. Uh, you got a glimpse of this slide here, uh, which was a little bit premature. But this is uh, Bullard Wash, uh, west central Arizona, uh, northwest of Wickenburg. And this is a part of the Sonoran Desert. There are yucca iladas in the background, there are saguaros, and these are uh, members of the eastern form of Joshua trees, the yucca jaegerianas. Uh, I'm just going to refer to them as brevifolias and jaegerianas, even though it's bad form and I probably won't survive peer review. Um, but here they are growing in some uh, explicitly Sonoran desert surroundings. It's a kind of a remarkable sight. And here they are in front of the Grand Wash Cliffs, all the way at the other end of the state of Arizona. Uh, Grand Wash Cliffs are the place in the west where the Colorado River flows out of the Grand Canyon. Here in the uh, uh, Robbers Roost area, just east of, uh, of Walker Pass in the West Mojave, southern end of uh, uh, the Great Basin, they're growing with rabbit brush. And uh, you notice that these Trees are uh, shaped significantly differently than most of the trees that we have here in Joshua Tree and very much different from the Jaegerianas. They're much shorter in general, less branched, and much more likely to put energy into uh, lateral sprouting, uh, clonal, uh, giving rise to clonal clumps. And uh, we will touch on this later in the talk as well. Here they are in cosmopolitan LA County, growing in a stand of California buckwheat, which is a, a plant that's very common in the desert, as you know, but it's also uh, quite common in the, uh, in the coastal parts of California, especially in the South. And uh, you'll see pinion and juniper in the background there. Uh, this is the floor of the Antelope Valley, where because of more moderate temperatures and uh, increased rainfall compared to further into the desert, 
Uh, you still have conditions that are roughly like the uh, middle of the Pleistocene and the pluvial, and so Joshua trees grow as a component of the PJ there. But just one more biome in which they grow. So when you talk about the future of Joshua trees, you kind of have to talk about uh, the ecological relationships that they have, because it's the ecological relationships that sustain Joshua trees and that allow Joshua trees to sustain other organisms. And once you start unraveling those, uh, not just Joshua trees, but entire ecosystems can suffer. This is a, a fairly pixelated, I apologize, a photo of a yucca moth. This is, I believe, Tegeticula synthetica, which is the pollinator for the Western population of Joshua trees. And uh, as Joshua tree fans no doubt know uh, by heart, the uh, yucca moth and Joshua trees, indeed all species of yuccas that we uh, have examined so far, have a very special relationship in which they rely utterly on each other for reproduction. The uh, yuccas will flower. This is a Joshua tree flower and a Joshua tree moth. Uh, the moths emerge from pupation uh, in which they do underground. They come out of the ground, fly around, they mate. Uh, the males go off to be uh, become food for night lizards and things like that, uh, having uh, outlived their usefulness at that point. And the females do all the hard work, which will be familiar concept to some of you. And they go from flower to flower. They collect pollen and tuck it into a little ball where their chin would be if they had chins. And then they deliberately put that pieces of that pollen into the ovaries of Joshua tree flowers. They then lay eggs in the ovaries. And generally one, sometimes two eggs will uh, hatch out in the developing fruit. There are five chambers of seeds in the fruit. So, uh, you know, they'll take 20% or 40% of those potential fruit to feed their young and the other 60 or 80% remain on the tree for years and years and years. This is a problem for Joshua trees. Uh, they do not throw their fruit down on the ground. Uh, they do not release the seeds out of the fruit. Joshua trees are really bad at dispersing their uh, potential progeny. There is a lot of discussion about this in Joshua tree circles. And uh, about, yeah, about a dozen years ago, uh, there was some uh, very well publicized speculation that this was in fact a relic of a coevolutionary relationship in which the Shasta giant ground sloth, Nothrotherium shastensi, shown here in a really wonderful uh, painting by uh, my friend Carl Buell, who's an amazing, very talented paleo artist. I mean, he's still around, but his subjects are paleo. He's not all that paleo. But it, there's there was significant thought that these guys would swallow entire uh, sections of this fruit in one gulp uh, without chewing the seeds and thereby destroying, without chewing the fruit and thereby destroying the seeds and uh, walk several miles very slowly and then deposit the seeds in a nice packet of moisture and fertilizer there to grow into mature Joshua trees and very much like the uh, the dodos and the trees in genus Calvaria and the islands in the Indian Ocean, uh, where the dodos were uh, obligate uh, dispersers of Calvaria seeds and Calvaria are in trouble now. Uh, Joshua trees would be in trouble because somehow all the giant ground sloths went away possibly to climate change, possibly to uh, the 
uh, introduction of bows and arrows and, and such into their habitat. Uh, we're not sure we can get uh, paleoanthropologists arguing uh, very entertainingly about that. And then uh, it was really kind of cool to see uh, paleoecology covered in places like NPR and USA Today. And, you know, I think we sh should all be grateful for those kind of opportunities. But as it turns out, it may be that uh, giant ground sloths really didn't do all that much to disperse Joshua tree seeds. They definitely ate Joshua trees. There are places where sloth dung is uh, preserved in caves, a gypsum cave in Grand Canyon National Park being an example. Uh, the dung there is, you know, well over 8,000 years old and still shows uh, really, really good evidence of what sloths like to eat. And Joshua trees were uh, emphatically part of what they ate. Seems like it would be really handy for them to pull down uh, Joshua tree limbs with those uh, those fingernails. Uh, they could uh, move the branches around without getting impaled. It was probably pretty handy. But there are precious few Joshua tree seeds in that mummified sloth dung. And uh, graduate students have spent a lot of time looking for it because uh, that's the kind of job that graduate students get, is sifting through sloth dung. So it uh, looks as though Joshua tree seeds either weren't something that sloths like to eat all that much, or they didn't survive digestion in recognizable form, or some of each, or maybe we just don't have sufficient dung in the world to, to gauge. But at any rate, there is no real concrete evidence for it. And uh, as it turns out, Christopher Smith, who some of you probably know, who's done a lot of research on Joshua tree genetics and speciation and uh, behavior and ecology and paleoecology in the last uh, decade has done modeling in which uh, he has determined that Joshua trees are pretty much dispersed through their uh, potential range uh, at the moment, which means that they've been 8,000 years without sloths at the very least and still have managed to get their seeds wherever they uh, can grow. And turns out that uh, the main uh, mammalian disperser of Joshua tree seeds may be something that contemporary gardeners probably wish would go extinct, namely the uh, white-tailed antelope ground squirrel seen here resting after eating all of my garden plants. Antelope ground squirrels are really efficient dispersers of Joshua tree seeds. They climb up those trees uh, with the fruit hanging up there uh, for years. They uh, uh, open up the fruit, they chew through it, let it fall to the ground and collect it. Uh, they fill their pouches full of seeds, they go and cache them in different places and they forget all the places where they cache them or they don't get to them or a coyote uh, picks them up. And some of those seeds, if they are in places that uh, have the right conditions, uh, they will sprout. And some very few of those that sprout will survive to reproductive maturity. And this is a species right here that is instrumental in providing those cached seeds, the kind of environment that they can grow to maturity. And this is Coleogeny ramosissima, black brush. Uh, it's less common in Joshua Tree National Park than it used to be. Uh, it does not come back from fire at all well. It doesn't come back from bulldozers or uh, you know, off-road vehicles all that well either. It, like Joshua Tree, seems to be a relic of cooler, wetter times. Uh, it's doing just fine in more northern parts of the Mojave and in the Great Basin. Uh, but uh, study, I think it was about 15 years ago, uh, in the Panamint Mountains showed that recovery in the warm parts of the desert for a uh, after disturbance can take 
periods of time that are longer than current periods of climatic stability, uh, for which you can just assume that means eight to 12,000 years, which is a current period of climatic stability. At any rate, uh, Kaliogeny, as many of you know, is scratchy to hike through. Doesn't particularly have thorns, but it, it does have stiff little stems that uh, you know resist being bent. It is not really attractive to browsers. Uh, the leaves on it are probably nutritious enough, but they're hidden well within that sort of unpalatable uh, branching uh, wood material. And uh, they, they provide uh, some shelter from sun and wind. Uh, the soil under uh, Kaliogeny is going to be a little bit cooler, a little bit more moist, uh, definitely much more conducive to Joshua trees uh, sprouting and then growing for you know, 10, 15, 20 years until they emerge from Kaliogeny and then probably just sucking up all the resources of Kaliogeny that uh, gave birth to them uh, requires for future survival. Nurse plants often do not fare well when their uh, progeny grow up. But at any rate, uh, this is a, an organism and a vegetative community that is crucial to the survival of Joshua trees. Joshua trees can use other plants as, as nurse plants. They can use choyas, they can use Mojave yuccas, they can use creosote, uh, but Kaliogeny is really the uh, preferred, I mean, it's not like they go around and choose Kaliogeny, uh, but it's just seems to be the one that they work best with. And uh, as we warm up the desert and dry it out, uh, we are going to lose Kaliogeny. And not only do the uh, shrubs eventually die after about 500 years or so, but they are really susceptible to wildfire. This is uh, the Hackberry fire, uh, the remnants of the Hackberry fire in Mojave National Preserve. I took this in, uh, I think it was early August, 05. And most of those little brown, blackish, grayish dots on the landscape were black brush. Here is the vicinity of Covington Flat. And you can see where there were fires, uh, multiple fires over the last 20 years or so. Uh, there are spots that are devoid of coleogeny and where they uh, where there were no fires, the coleogeny is still there. And some of these fires are uh, 96 or so, and the coleogeny is not growing back. It looks like five successive cool, wet winters is needed for coleogeny germination. And uh, when was the last time we got that? So we're, uh, we're looking at uh, a desert that is becoming not only more hostile to Joshua trees, uh, you know, it's uh, drying out uh, fewer opportunities for them to survive. Uh, wildfires will take out populations of Joshua tree. Uh, you know, repeated wildfires will increase the mortality. Um, you know, 30 to 40 percent of Joshua trees might survive a single fire, but there is increasingly no such thing as a single fire in the Mojave, uh, where we have uh, invasive grasses like schismus and uh, and cheat and things like that, uh, providing continuous fuel. Uh, we just can't expect fire after fire after fire. And not only do they do in the Joshua trees, but they, they will do in the plants that allow them to survive into, uh, into adulthood. As a result, uh, in the last few years, we've seen a lot of um, maps uh, like this, which is from a uh, 2005, if I remember right, study from uh, Ken Cole with the USGS, who uh, modeled Joshua tree survival in a 
uh, in a warmer, drier desert uh, and compare this, which is roughly the uh, current distribution. There were some problems with, uh, with the range shown here, but uh, it's roughly the current distribution with projected future distribution. And as you can see, ain't no Joshua trees in Joshua Tree National Park in this projection. Uh, the ones in uh, Mojave Preserve still hanging on, Death Valley, Southern Nevada still hanging on a little bit. There's a few more in the Owens Valley, but really uh, and we're losing a huge percentage. And subsequent studies have refined uh, these projections, but they haven't really changed the news, which is that uh, we have the opportunity uh, to save some very small populations in places like Queen Valley uh, if we do something about fire, but it's incredibly likely that we will uh, have uh, a southern Mojave that becomes increasingly inhospitable to Joshua trees. Chris, I'm starting to hyperventilate. We did promise optimism. I'm getting is it, it forthcoming? I'm getting there. Okay. I, I just I want to build up the contrast so that the optimism seems all that much more optimistic. Man, it sure is bleak right now. Thank you. You're you're very effective at that. <laughs> okay. Excellent segue. There are three reasons I find for optimism here, and uh, two of them have to do with what the Joshua tree can do and is doing on its own. One of them has to do with what some of our friends and neighbors are uh, doing to take action uh, over and beyond what the National Park Service's uh, devoted staff are doing to educate people about the trees and to keep people from running into them with their uh, campers and all that kind of stuff that uh, people in the parks uh, and in the state parks and to a lesser extent on BLM lands and such do every single day. Uh, but the NGO community, the, uh, not the non-governmental organization community is starting to step up as well. In 2015, the group Wild Earth Guardians filed a petition with uh, what was at that point a much friendlier uh, interior department to list the Joshua tree under the U.S. Endangered Species Act as a threatened species, which would have uh, it would have been kind of groundbreaking because it uh, would have been a listing that uh, in large part relied on climate change as one of the threats. It was climate change wasn't the only uh, threat listed to uh, Joshua trees. They talked about fires. They talked about uh, uh, inappropriate recreation. They talked about urban development and suburban development. They talked about energy development, all that kind of stuff. Um, but climate change was kind of the center of the petition. And uh, it took something like 19 months for Fish and Wildlife to uh, deliver their 90-day finding on uh, whether or not uh, it listing the tree may be warranted. They ruled that listing may be warranted, and they went on to do their 12-month finding, which came out uh, in only about 48 months. And unsurprisingly, uh, given changes in politics, the uh, service declined to list the tree as threatened under the Federal Endangered Species Act. Fish and Wildlife did, however, do something kind of interesting, which was to declare without really having the authority to do so, but, you know, web, uh, that they were going to consider Joshua trees as belonging to two species, namely the western trees, Yucca brevifolia, and the eastern trees, the shrubbier, branchier ones, Yucca jagariana. 
And so, uh, as a result of both the uh, denial of listing and Fish and Wildlife's sort of uh, uh, out of the blue uh, decision to treat them as two species, our neighbor, Brendan Cummings, who is a conservation director for the California, uh, sorry, for the Center for Biological Diversity, uh, filed under, petitioned under the California Endangered Species Act to list the Western population of the trees, the Yucca Brema folia, as threatened under Cal ESA. And on April 16th, the California Fish and Game Commission will be uh, receiving a uh, recommendation from the, uh, from the uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife in the state of California as to whether or not to declare that listing may be warranted. We have reason to expect that we will get good news out of that and that the Fish and Game Commission will kick off the process of determining whether or not to list the tree. And uh, the Western Joshua tree, Yucca brevifolia, as opposed to Yucca jaegeriana, is I think the, uh, the right spe subspecies or species, depending on your perspective, to go ahead with listing on for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, much more of the population of Yucca jaegeriana is protected. Uh, it's on public lands. It's under less uh, less immediate threat of development, though uh, public lands bill in Clark County may change that. We will see. Um, but a lot of the a lot of the territory is in, say, Lake Mead National Recreation Area or Mojave National Preserve, uh, state parks, BLM wildernesses, things like that. And uh, so there's a little bit less pressure on the uh, Yucca Jagarianas to be uh, 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 turned into strip malls. Whereas uh, the uh, development pressure on the Western Joshua trees is rather extreme. The bulk of the population, uh, as you can see here, this is the Western Joshua trees are in the teal uh, sections. And you can see that right through the largest swath of, uh, of that uh, contiguous population you have from here in Joshua Tree on up through Lucerne Valley to the Victor Valley corridor and Barstow, and then over to the Lancaster and then up north through Ridgecrest. And that's pretty much ground zero for uh, real estate development in the California desert. Uh, there are a lot of Quiznos and Starbucks and things like that being proposed for uh, Joshua Tree habitat. So it's really uh, important, I think, that uh, those trees get some additional protection. You know, I would love to see additional state parks, national parks in that part of the desert. Um, you know, right now it is uh, Joshua Tree National Park that is the sole really stringent protection that the Western Joshua Trees have. So uh, this is a, a cause for optimism. What happens if uh, the tree is listed as threatened under the California Endangered Species Act? Well, it becomes a lot harder to cut down several thousand acres of them for development which is happening for urban development, it's happening for renewable energy development. Uh, fragmentation of the habitat is occurring at a fairly brisk clip and listing the trees as threatened under California ESA is uh, gonna be a, a very useful tool in slowing the rate of that development down. Here's a bleak photo uh, that ironically is part of why I'm optimistic about these trees. Fire is a huge problem, as I mentioned. Joshua trees did not, generally speaking, evolve in the presence of fire. 
uh, they are not, unlike a lot of uh, other organisms like closed cone pines and manzanitas and uh, ceanothus and grasses and things like that that you find in California, they are not only not reliant on fire for reproduction or survival, but they can't really tolerate it. Um, except that we saw the slide earlier of uh, the trees in the western part of the range growing in big clonal clumps. Uh, that was along the, the east side of the Sierra down by Walker Pass. This is right at the junction of the Sierra, the Tehachapis, and the San Gabriels. This is the westernmost grove of Joshua trees in the world. This is within, uh, within rock throwing distance of Interstate 5 going over the grapevine, just near Gorman. And this group of trees burned about, uh, well, this photo I took in, in 06. So I would say it was probably in 03 or a little bit after that, that they burned. And uh, I was happy to finally be visiting the westernmost grove of Joshua trees, which I'd heard about. I found the exit. I drove along the side roads and the frontage roads. I got to the grove and saw this and my heart sank. But I got into the grove anyway. I got out of my truck and walked around uh, just to go see what was what. And every single one of these trees, every single one, had multiple sprouts coming up from the bottom. And as it turns out, uh, and I don't know if anybody's done any really quantitative study on this, but the trees in the western part of the range seem to be fire adapted. And it makes sense. They've been growing in the foothills, northern foothills of the San Gabriels, uh, the eastern foothills of the Tehachapis and the Sierra. Those are places that are better watered. Those are places that uh, fire is more frequent. Uh, you're much more likely to have continuous grass and forb cover and that dries out in the summer and it catches on fire. And so Joshua trees that live in that area that don't develop some kind of adaptation to fire are gonna have a much harder time of surviving generation on generation. So this is reason number two for optimism is that I have the sense that Joshua trees in the west side of the, uh, of the range are working on a strategy to survive. I mean, it's teleological of me. Uh, obviously the trees do not have intent. They don't evolve in a certain direction that they pick, but it's just handy shorthand. Uh, it seems like they're working on a strategy to survive uh, climate change, at least on the Western side of the range. Uh, this is not at all a slam dunk. This is a conjecture of mine. Uh, it's not something that I would take as, as gospel. Uh, we definitely need to have some people work on, on doctorates, uh, graduate theses, things like that, uh, to determine whether or not there's any validity to this. We don't know how the moths uh, survive fire. Um, I mean, they're underground at least a few inches, and that's probably good, but but we really don't know. We don't know how things like the mycorrhizal fungi that uh, Joshua trees rely on are going to survive uh, hot fires on the surface. But nonetheless, at least in, uh, in places along the extreme western edge of the range, they are surviving fires. And that's a really, really wonderful piece of news, especially when you combine it with this. Here we are back at Robber's Roost, back at the intersection of the road uh, up to Walker Pass uh, into Ridgecrest and the road up to the great, uh, to the uh, Owens Valley. All of these trees just uh, hanging out, cloning themselves, uh, individual clones maybe lasting for thousands of years, despite the fact that individual stems of Joshua trees uh, rarely last past 250. And uh, they get up over the pass. Those of you who have been atop Walker Pass, there's a BLM campground there that's occasionally nice. Uh, there are Joshua trees on the Sierra Crest. 
Uh, if you look for them in a Sierra Nevada floor uh, store and Usinger's uh, Natural History of the Sierra, they are nowhere to be found, but they grow on the Sierra Crest. You can stand on the Pacific Crest Trail with a Fremontia behind you looking west and see Joshua trees in the distance. Um, they are, uh, again, a fairly remarkably adaptable plant and they grow on the top of the Sierra. Here is a screenshot of uh, Street View on Google Maps. On Route 178 between Onyx and Weldon. And this is well west of the, uh, the pass. We have obviously Joshua trees uh, growing here and uh, some good recruitment. You see the seedlings over to the, the left of that one uh, little guy on the, uh, on the left with all the branches, just, uh, just over to its, uh, its left are a couple of, uh, couple of sprouts, one of which is far enough away that it may, may actually be a seedling. Uh, there's a clonal clump uh, there too. And in the distance on the right, lots and lots of clumps of Joshua tree. And this is the spot where that was, okay, it was uh, between Canebrake and Weldon. Uh, if you notice something about the topography here, over by where it says Edison in the lower left-hand corner, that is the Central Valley. It's all downhill. This is, uh, it's a relatively flat plain from Canebrake to Weldon and to Lake Isabella. Joshua trees grow within a few miles of Lake Isabella. They're probably uh, enjoying it up there. It's much moister. It's much more likely to have uh, consecutive uh, cold, wet winters. Uh, snow is not uncommon up there. And, uh, and the Joshua trees are very likely to be uh, there, even as the southern Mojave gets drier and hotter. And then once they get to uh, Lake Isabella, they do not have to rely on those pesky antelope squirrels to distribute their seeds because all they have to do is have them fall into the Kern River and the Kern River will do the dispersing for them. And I just, you know, this is a long shot, admittedly. This is a lot of ifs piled on each other. But trees have a way of getting their uh, getting their seeds around. Joshua trees are bad at it compared to cottonwoods and maples and things like that, but they're still here. They've managed to find a way. There are certainly uh, squirrels to cache their seeds, uh, even if they stray out of the range of white-tailed antelope squirrels. And I just, the fact that there are Joshua trees west of Walker Pass is just, a, it's, a, uh, it's a source of immense hope for me. So it's interesting, uh, 14th of April, 1844, 14th of April pops up a lot in American history. It's the uh, date of Lincoln's assassination, uh, the date of the Titanic sinking. It's also the date when not only did Fremont see uh, Joshua trees for the first time, uh, he wasn't the first European to see them, he certainly wasn't the first person to see them, but he was the, uh, the first explorer to really note what they were uh, for the record. And it's really interesting uh, to me to consider the sentence before his description of coming over that um, low grassy plain with all the oaks and finding the repulsive Joshua trees. One of the purposes of his uh, exploration his expedition was to determine whether or not the myths of rivers traversing the West and flowing out into the Pacific Ocean were at all true. Boosters uh, on the East Coast who were uh, sort of cheering on the idea of colonizing the interior West and the West Coast really wanted there to be navigable rivers from the, uh, the front range, the, the west side of the front range 
all the way down through to uh, uh, to the Pacific Coast, and the uh, there are a bunch of bunch of different rivers that people had talked about. Uh, the Timpanogos River, uh, shown here, going into uh, Sir Francis Drake Drake's Bay uh, by Point Reyes. There's some uh, discussion of uh, rivers that flowed out of Utah and into the Willamette Valley. Uh, the big one that everybody has probably heard of uh, is the San Buenaventura River, which uh, is thought to have been inspired by somebody sailing past the mouth of the Ventura River, which apparently was very impressive uh, at that point. Uh, Ventura is a nice river, but it's certainly not the kind of thing that inspires speculation of uh, uh, a watershed thousands of miles long. By the time Fremont was exploring, the thought was that the, Ventura, the Buena Ventura River uh, would have emptied into the, the San Francisco Bay Delta. And Fremont went up and down the length of the Sierra Nevada, failed to find any gap in it, got over the lowest pass that he had reasonable access to, and wrote, there is no opening from the Bay of San Francisco into the interior of the continent. The two rivers which flow into it are comparatively short and not perpendicular to the coast, but lateral to it and having their heads toward Oregon and Southern California. So with one sentence, he destroyed the West as Americans were hoping it was. And then in the very next sentence, with his description of the repulsive members of the vegetable kingdom that he found the Joshua trees to be. He described the West, started to, to describe the West as it really was. And I find that just really compelling. And then when you consider the fact that if my harebrained scheme about Joshua trees working their way down the Kern River drainage into the Sierra foothills, is it all correct? that what was really happening when Fremont came out of Oak Creek was that he saw the Joshua trees basically heading past him going the other way. And I'm just gonna hold on to that. As unlikely as it may be, I'm gonna hold on to that vision as uh, my uh, part of my image of California in the uh, 30th century and uh, and I just, again, want to thank you for doing your part to preserve the Joshua trees that we have here in the 21st century. And that's what I've got. Happy to answer any questions. Wow, thank you, Chris. I have not thought about California in the 20th, sorry, the 30th century. And um, that is the kind of thinking that the Park Service often does. Well, um, I wanted to let me go ahead. So first of all, you know, as as you folks have heard on other webinars, Kevin and I are still learning this software. And so our webinar may automatically cut off in two minutes, but we are not sure. We're going to imagine that it's not cutting off in two minutes. I'm going to go ahead and unmute everyone and give folks to ask a question. You can either unmute your phone and ask or type it in the box. So if you're on a phone, you now have the ability to unmute and ask a verbal question or, oh, okay. Um, we do have one question from John Davis. Can you elaborate on periods, the phrase periods of climatic stability? Ah, yes. Um, the idea is that we're in a, uh, a time period where the climate has not changed much. We haven't fluctuated back and forth between uh, between cold and hot. You know, no uh, alta thermal period uh, coming right on the heels of an uh, ice age or pluvial. But the uh, with that particular study of uh, uh, coleogeny uh, 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 revegetation, I guess you'd call it uh, the. Uh, the phrase was current periods of stability. And uh, so even though, you know, ice ages themselves lasted for a lot longer than uh, 
uh, eight or 12,000 years a lot of the time. Uh, basically what they were trying to say is um, in this study was that these, uh, these plants are not gonna grow back anytime soon. Uh, they relied on conditions that we have not had through this relatively stable period of the last uh, 12,000 years pulse glacial. And uh, it may be that much longer before they have uh, conditions that are conducive to their, uh, their return, if ever. All right, we've got another question from Kylie. Are the Joshua trees in Cactus Flats near Big Bear doing well? Are we seeing them move to higher elevations or are they staying around there? Uh, they seem to be doing well. I mean, uh, they are as susceptible to fire as the, the ones in Covington Flat, uh, but they are getting conditions that are, uh, I think, much more, uh, much more copacetic for them. Uh, you know, they, uh, they're putting out really, really lush leaves. They get snow that, you know, melts and trickles in really well. And it's interesting that most of the descriptions of Joshua trees that you see uh, talk about them having an altitudinal range of somewhere between, uh, you know, 3,000 and 5,000 feet, roughly speaking. And there are some trees up in that uh, that stretch, as you probably know, that are growing above 7,000 feet. So it's it's clear that they're finding uh, uh, unusually good conditions up there. And I think um, I think they are probably under less threat, assuming that uh, fires continue to be uh, controlled um, in places where they have not historically been uh, uh, been a, a factor. Um, to, uh, um, I think they're, they're likelier to be, uh, around in a couple hundred years than say, uh, the ones at, uh, 2,600 feet in the Morongo basin. But, uh, you know, that's spitballing and, uh, you know, there are always unanticipated, uh, events that come up, um, right now they look great. Okay. Next question. Um, Susie Boyd says she sees many Joshua trees when she gets firewood near Baldwin Lake off of Burns Canyon Road. So in alpine forests, climate change, you know, presents threats due to insect infestation, temperature increases, etc. So are there climate change threats to Joshua trees beyond the risk of fire? Uh, and that's pretty much the same spot uh, that uh, Kylie was asking about, I believe, um, you know, Cactus Flat and Baldwin Lake are a couple of miles apart. Um, but yeah, you know, that's a really good question. I, uh, I know that there are a couple of borers, uh, you know, uh, moth larvae that uh, target yuccas. And there's, uh, there's one in particular that uh, lives on Joshua trees, the yucca giant skipper. Um, really kind of a, a decorative uh, decorative adult but the uh, uh, the larvae will tunnel through and you generally just take a branch or at most a, a limb I have no idea about uh, whether they're going to be more prevalent at higher elevations as uh, as things warm up I think it's it is likely that there are going to be opportunistic uh, uh, I, uh, uses, I guess. They want to. I don't want to unfairly uh, castigate insects for trying to make a living, but uh, I th there there may be uh, unanticipated relationships between the insects and Joshua trees up there that uh, are not beneficial to the Joshua trees. Um, that said, there's also uh, uh, damage from mammals. You know, it's well established in. Uh, in lower elevations and in Joshua Tree, I, actually this is where the study was done, that in drought years, uh, animals like uh, rabbits and hares and uh, squirrels and rats are very likely to girdle Joshua trees in order to get at the, uh, 
the moisture underneath the uh, uh, the exterior cork layer bark, um, and there is nothing that would indicate that uh, squirrels and such up in the San Bernardinos wouldn't also do that. Uh, but again, that's that's kind of spitballing. I think um, I think that would be an, an interesting area for study and I think we may have some opportunity to do it because they they are going to be sitting there uh, and you know the uh, environment of the mountains is changing and they will provide an opportunity for somebody it'll be interesting to see who takes advantage of it Cool, folks are still unmuted if you want to ask a question. Susie says thanks, Kylie says thanks, or sorry, Kyle says thanks. Um, so sorry, Kyle. Still unmuted if you want to ask a question or provide a comment. All right, well, we have the new knowledge that we can go past our strictly reserved time. And I really appreciate folks getting on today. I'm learning so much from these and um, look forward to talking to folks next Wednesday. If you have an idea and you want to give a webinar or you want to nominate a friend, neighbor, or um, mentor to give a webinar, let us know. Uh, Kevin, anything else? No, but I just want to thank Chris for being here today, and I want to thank our audience. And yes, our next webinars will be on Wednesday, April the 15th with Kurt Loeschner on Birds of Joshua Tree National Park, part two. And Kevin Powell will be speaking on cl his climbing bolt replacement program in Joshua Tree National Park. Until then, please stay safe and healthy. Thank you.